local watering hole about six blocks from my house, and I walked in there. And I sat down to have a beer afterwards. <clears throat> about two o'clock in the afternoon, there was a large rumbling outside, and in comes, uh, it was 38 Milwaukee Outlaws, motorcycle gang, with all their chains and their leather and their knives and all their attitude. And I'm sitting there, and a guy walks up to me, he goes, <clears throat> you're sitting in my chair. This is 200 chairs in here, go pick a different one. He says, you're outnumbered 38 to 1. I says, no, I'm not. I says, this is my chair, you go find a different one. So he pulls out a 12-inch boy knife, and he grabs my tie, and he puts it underneath there, and he says, you an attorney? I says, no, I'm a federal judge, and I prosecute judges for a living. I says, and you still go find yourself another chair. He says, you ain't afraid. He says, what do I got to be afraid for? You ain't going to do anything. He says, all your frazzle, I says, doesn't mean anything. I says, you think you can pull that knife? I says, go ahead and try it. I says, I'm going to finish my beer, and you're not going to be here. <laughs> and he goes, what does that mean? I says, do I look worried? I says, you're not going to be here. So uh, there was an Indian in court with me that morning as he watched me prosecute a judge. And he says, hey, wait, wait, no. He says, that's Judge Miller. He says, I watched him prosecute a judge this morning. He, he is who he says he is. So the guy, the president of the club, steps in and says, okay, put it away. He says, well, I says, this is still my chair. He says, I ain't moving. He <laughs> says, well, let me buy you a beer. He says, there's an apology for that. He says, well, as long as you're buying me a beer and I'm going to be here for a few minutes drinking my beer, how would you like to know how to get out of your traffic tickets? So I said, you just go to court? You sue for the correct parse syntax grammar for the voidance of perjury. Boy, that like rang a bell in everyone's ears and this guy picks me up, puts me up on the thing and says, do a seminar. <laughs> <laughs> so for 35 minutes I had three beers and uh, I did a presentation on grammar. And he, the guy goes, here's my business card. Anybody bothers you, you just call me up, we'll break your legs. <laughs> So, and that was the last time I had a run-in with those boys, and it's been pretty quiet. Nobody's ever bothered me. So, I got, when it comes to court stories, I've got dozens of them. Yeah, go ahead. When we file for the second one after you say after the 48 days, it's got to be 48 at least. Yes. 48 days, or what if you don't get on 48 days, like 50-something? Oh, you got a year to file after, after, you know, so don't worry about, that's as fast as you can file your fault. You're going to take your, your quo warranto complaint and your fault document contract claim, and you're going to send it to the Attorney General to the attention of the Indiana False Claims Act Task Force. Sent in by a third party? No, by you. You only got to do the first servicing with an independent party for the quo warranto. After that, you can take care of all your own filings. You'll be given that form along with instructions of who to contact. Okay? So I, I, I've got all this covered. These forms just came out the 28th of August. Today is the 24th of September. So they've only been on the market for four weeks. So as I, I've been traveling, I've been to Hawaii and California and in San Francisco, LA, San Diego, Honolulu, Maui, Big Island. Uh, been here in Milwaukee, uh, yeah, in Milwaukee. But every few days uh, I'm in a different part of the world I move around really fast. In the U.S. Attorney's Office, along with the Marshal Service, track me 24-7, and every time I walk into a courthouse, I don't care where it is in the United States, they already have my pictures hanging up that if this guy shows up, you will call the Marshal Service, and the U.S. Justice Department wants to sit down and talk to this guy. <laughs> El Pronto. So it's always a lot of fun, yeah. You will not have a trial date for the document, contract, federal, postal, vessel, at all. Okay, I'm talking about the... Bankruptcy? No, the... Uh, oh, the other criminal side, okay. The criminal, when that takes place, I'm a claimant on your case. I'm a claimant on all your cases that I've written. That means you can put me on the phone 
and I can testify by phone. My question to the prosecuting attorney is, can you produce the law, rule, regulation, or co code written with the correct parse syntax grammar for the avoidance of perjury? I've syntaxed the lawsuit. I've syntaxed the DA, the, the indictment. It's physical evidence that have been supplied to you. Your lawsuit should be turned over to the Attorney General in Indianapolis or in South Bend, Indiana, uh, which is where you have your federal courts as this individual at the state level is creating an illusion by which he is trying to say there's a law that doesn't exist to prosecute me under the McNaughton rule. And you invoke the McNaughton rule under the right wrong showing why this and this person under Title 42, 1986 for knowledge of the correct parse syntax grammar stop and correct his own paperwork to do it correct. If you have a complaint against me, then use correct grammar. Show me where the Congress, the Senate, the legislature, and the Supreme Court of the state of Indiana has created a law, rule, regulation, or code that is in the correct grammar by which I've violated. Doesn't exist, I'll tell you that right now. So don't pretend like you understand what they say. The, 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 the answer to any question is, can I see that in the correct parse syntax grammar for the avoidance of the perjury? And I don't care how many times you got to say it. Do it for an hour. You got 50 questions, repeat it 50 times. Repeat that again. Can I see? Okay. The word order is spelled how? O R D, a bound two consonants? <laughs> no contract? Don't forget the judge is not on your plane. There. You can repeat that sentence to anything that fiction has to say to you, and in most cases, we'll vacate the case within that one sentence. Even when they ask me for my name? We did that already. <laughs> what is your name? Now, he's going to say, well, uh, arrest the nom de guerre, uppercase spelling, which is a dead person, name, assigned to your driver's license because it identifies you as a non your dead person. And you're, as a citizen, you have your state ID as a non your identity, henceforth putting you in the jurisdiction, but you've already entered the courthouse, so therefore you're, you left Indiana. You now are in the state of Indiana, which is the name of the courthouse, as a foreign vessel in dry dock controlled by the port authorities. While on that vessel, you have now trespassed, and no matter what you're there for, you're in a trespassing position, unless you have a United States passport, and you have your paperwork filed ahead of time with the clerk of the court in possession of the stamp, 
put my business card on with a, a flag on it, a stamp. And you would then become a postmaster under the correct parse syntax grammar, advertise with your contract to say, I have a contract here with the correct parse syntax grammar. This individual sitting next to me who would be the DA doesn't. So therefore you enter, you're in a superior position because you signed a stamp, you now become the federal court judge in that plane because that's a federal flag on a federal plane. You have a federal stamp and a federal flag on your paperwork and you're wearing a federal flag. So how does a state court in fiction where the judge isn't on your plane now capture you? Your position then is to turn to the bailiff and say, I deputize you as my tip staff, stand to attention. I have a federal oath and you can, you can uh, if you had one of my oaths and had the knowledge, you could back that up. I can back it up. But I'm also a sovereign. I'm also granted a sovereign's country, the, the director of my own country through the United Nations. As the condition of state in a world of fiction is so unique that the United Nations had to make me the 200th member of the United Nations. I don't pay a $1.6 million a year fee to the United Nations because how does a fact contract with a fiction, but the fiction still has to recognize that the condition of state does exist in quantum. Henceforth, I exist as a sovereign condition of state amongst the world of fiction and I'm recognized by the fiction not to touch, but to be a teacher as a plenipotentiary judge to go out in the world and do so as an ambassador contracted with 82 countries have diplomatic immunity to that end. So I'm, once I got that, they locked the door behind me. I'm the only guy that does it. They gave me that position, and I've been completely honorable and trustworthy to that position and responsible, and it's published all over the world, and it's respected by the other countries. And that's why the Justice Department and the State Department and the, the uh, judges around the world are hands off. This guy is who he says he is. As a person who has signed a stamp, you have a constitution in, on your document. That constitution is like an oath of office. But to have a oath as a judge responsible only to your piece of paper that you have signed that stamp on and file an additional oath with that, with the clerk of the courts. It says you will only be responsible to be a federal judge on your own personal document for the correct parse syntax grammar. And as a judge, you're immune from prosecution, but you have to be correct at all times. If you don't know what to say, don't talk an adverb verb. <laughs> say nothing. You've got your paperwork speaks for you. Two plus two doesn't equal four. If you write it on paper, I can see what it equals up to. But if you're gonna get me into an oral argument with 150 variables, you ain't gonna win, it's, it's nonsense, so don't even go there. Or four plus four equals eight, F-O-R plus F-O-U-R equals A-T-E, or A-T-E and E-A-G-H-T equals A-T-E. I mean, you know, we can do this all day long. Did you hear what I said, what I meant, what I said, what I said, what I meant, what I said? Yes? So, so he would ask, so do, do I send the mail? Or what, what, like if the judge would ask you, so what, what, what's your mailing address? Or is this your mailing address? This is conversation. This is conversation. So you say, for the claimant's knowledge of the facts is with, would you say that? Yes, exactly. That you're asking him, ask me a sentence that's in written quantum language. You, you see, all the information is in the paperwork. And you can say, for the witness's knowledge of the fact is with the, the uh, document, with the, with the docked document, in front of you. Because that is the court. You've given him written information. He's trying to get you into an oral argument. This is, this is a case with a man by the name of George. This is in Los Angeles, California. George was having his home repossessed. And the district attorney had him in tort 
12 times in a year. Well, they brought me in on the 12th, on the 12th hearing. 47 people piled into the courtroom because I was there. And my contract with George was to vacate the case and give him clear title to his house. So George comes in, he gets before the judge, he says, I have, uh, I have counsel. And the judge says, okay, counsel come up. I says, the prosecuting attorney over here has 110 pages, I've sent text all 110 pages, it says absolutely nothing. He's used false and misleading information, fictitious conveyance of grammar, and it's committed mail fraud because he's taken a paycheck for committing this fraud in the first case under misappropriations. Judge says, you're correct. That document does say nothing. I hereby vacate the case. George, you have your house clear title. The court will not take it from you. And then the judge stood up, took off his robe, laid it on the bench, got off the robe thing, came down, walked over to the side door, a room about this size, opened the door up, turned around and says, hey, George, uh, congratulations on your win. Uh, and George is just still standing there. He says, let's do something different. He says, why don't we say that the paperwork that the district attorney did here after a whole year now is actually a fact and he did everything correct. Will you agree to that? Is that okay with you? And George says, okay. He says, take his house and walked out the door. <laughs> and he stood there after he said the word okay in front of 44 people and he goes and you meaning me he goes are you Judge David Wynn Miller from Honolulu, Hawaii the one that prosecutes judges I says yes he says you got 10 seconds to hit the door and get out of here he says because I'm going to have you arrested for trespassing on my vessel in dry dock <laughs> <laughs> and I was out the door because I was in the peanut gallery and I had three marshals chasing me. <laughs> I got out the door in time. But George lost his house. He stood there and he just glowed like a light bulb. My contract was to get his house back. I won the house, I got kicked out of court, and he lost the house. So, should have kept his mouth shut and walked out of the door, yes. So then everybody, we went all outside in the parking lot. And I said to the people, did I win the case? They said yes. Did I fulfill my contract? They all said yes. Did George give back his house to the district attorney? Everybody said yes. Am I liable? Everybody said no. Enough said about that. Let's go back to the seminar. So we all had, had a seminar this afternoon. <clears throat> Another case, George. This is a different George in San Francisco. We, uh, we go into court, it's a state court. George is, uh, he's there for uh, illegal detainer, trespassing for the third time on the property he was evicted from. He paid a $10,000 fine and was sentenced to two years in prison. This was the morning he was to report at nine o'clock to surrender to the marshals. So, he says, Dave, will you come to court with me? He says, I'm going to go to jail for two years. Is there anything you can do for me? I says, well, let's, let's go to court and see what, what happens. <clears throat> so he presented me with a six-page doc, six document for his illegal detainer and trespassing. I sent it from the prosecuting attorney and wrote a Title 42 lawsuit similar to the same ones that you that have mortgages are similar to, or like your own for criminal. Uh, that was the, the basis for this lawsuit. The, uh, the judge, uh, George, goes into court and, and says, uh, Your Honor, I have counsel. When he, when he was asked anything, do you have to say? So I walked up and I says, I have uh, bailiff. I says, uh, give these papers to the judge. And bailiff <clears throat> came over, took them, handed them to the judge. Judge immediately stands up looks at him and goes, this is a federal case, this is a state court. He says, you can't file these here, take them back. I says, that's a federal flag, that's a federal stamp. I hold a federal judge's oath on this plane in correct grammar. 
you don't have a correct grammar. I syntaxed your oath and I syntaxed the district attorney and if you look at that, I'm prosecuting your district attorney for false and misleading information. And that individual is facing a $25 million fine and 30 years in prison for trying to cheat this individual and put him in jail for two years at $75,000 an hour. Under Sanders versus English 950 Fed Second, I have grounds under Title 42, 1986 for knowledge of the fraud that's been perpetrated, and I am here as a federal judge to stop and correct it. Well, this is a federal court. I says, you're not even in court. You're on a different plane than the rest of us. Bailiff, I hereby deputize me as my tip staff. Arrest that individual for impersonation of a judge and arrest this over individual over here as I have a warrant for a federal crime that he has committed, and here's his warrant. The judge goes, wait, wait, stop. We're going to do something different. I'm hereby vacating all charges against George. Bailiff, I want you to go downstairs and erase him from the system. Give him back his $10,000 plus interest for two years, which is $3,000. Cut him a check for $13,000. George, all charges have been dropped against you. You are free to go out. Now, Mr. Miller, uh, I have vacated the all charges against George. I've given back all of his money. Therefore, there is no contract between the state of California and George. So therefore, you have no complaint because everything's been vacated. Prosecuting an attorney is a Chinese man. Stands up and says, I object, Your Honor. He says, I just saved you $25 million. Just so shut up and sit down. So he shuts up. And then she goes, wait a minute. What's your name again? This is David Focal and David hyphen Wynn Focal and Miller. Are you that, that, that judge from Hawaii? He goes, the very same. She goes, oh. oh, okay. I says, bailiff, arrest the judge. She took off and ran out of the courtroom. Meantime, the bailiff took George and went down, and then after she vacated the room, the district attorney just sat there like a bum. The bailiff took George and went downstairs and checked him out. So we're outside. About 20 minutes later, he comes out with his check for $13,000. Free man, didn't have to go to prison for two years. And he goes, I didn't get my house. I says, my contract was so that you didn't want to go to jail. My contract was to vacate all charges. My contract was to get your money back. Didn't I fulfill all my contracts with you? And I got 22 people there from my seminar that came with me and they wanted to watch me in court do this. There it was. He said, well, you fulfilled all your terms of the contract, made the case go away, George is free. He bought me a cup of coffee. <laughs> Third case scenario, IRS, Miami, Florida. Lady comes to my seminar, she goes, <clears throat> can you do IRS? And she says, yeah, real simple. I've won over $10 million in IRS cases, about 12 of them to date. She says, well, I gotta be in court tomorrow morning, nine o'clock, in IRS court down at the federal building. Will you come with me? And I said, sure, it'd be fun. So, being in Miami, I was on vacation, and uh, I, I put on my surfer shorts, my surfer shirt, and my flip-flops, because I was on vacation, I go with her. And she, uh, we, we walk into the IRS office, and <clears throat> the IRS agent comes in, he's 33 years old, by the way, and <clears throat> she says, uh, she asked me, she says, what do I do? I says, well, give them all of your paperwork, cooperate 100%. And the IRS agent says, are you an attorney? I'm going, no, I'm not an attorney. And says, do I look like an attorney? I says, I'm on vacation. So she says, oh, well, I want David to come in here with me. I just need some moral support. I'm kind of nervous about all this stuff. And she says, and he goes, well, okay, Dave, you can come in and sit next to her. So I sat there quiet for about an hour. Every time she, he asks for something, she, she says to me, should I give them the paperwork? I says, yes, fully cooperate. Well, the IRS was real pleased, the fact that I was giving her moral support, helping the IRS get all the paperwork filed. He wrote out three, all the forms from 19, uh, 2004, five and six, three years. After the paperwork was all filled out, eight pages, she owed $38,000 in back taxes. So she then signs the forms, slides them across the table, and I says to the IRS agent, I says, uh, mind if I ask a question? Are you an attorney? I says, I thought we discussed that already. I says, that's a question. 
If she committed false and misleading information to you, can you prosecute her? Oh, yes. So can I ask you another question? If she committed perjury in this interview, as you have a recorder here and you recorded it for the IRS, can you prosecute her for perjury? He says, yes, we can. He says, uh, you know, you want her to sign right here, is that correct? Under penalty of perjury? You know that under is an adverb, means no contract, of penalty, which is a verb, of is an adverb, making perjury a verb. You want to show me the verb perjury and penalty in the dictionary? Isn't that false and misleading information? Isn't that perjury by your own confession? And then I syntaxed in the next 35 minutes all eight pages as I identified the parts 